Thank you for coming to the first of two Ignite Talk presentations today. There'll be another block of presentations this evening. Um, I can tell the crowd is enthusiastic. We have wonderful speakers with us today. My name is Amy Newcomb. I'm from Dartmouth College, and I serve as the academic director for the program there. It's my absolute privilege to have done that for the last three years, and I hope to get the opportunity to do that for another two. Um, and the summit is always a highlight as we gather and we get to meet all the amazing fellows that we didn't come to know in our small group of 25, and to see the enthusiasm and the shared insight that comes and where people are headed as they head back to the continent later this week. So I have the privilege today of introducing the first block of Ignite speakers. And we're going to ask that as we go through the talks, that we let each speaker speak. And then we'll hold our question and answer till the end. Uh, the themes today are touching on aspects of equality, uh, access, opportunity, many other themes that run in our track of business and entrepreneurship and beyond. So we hope that in their remarks, it instills some additional questions for us, some insights, some action. Again, these are Ignite Talks. They're meant to get us going and thinking in new ways. So without further ado, I'm going to ask that folks welcome our first speaker, Peter Nawa, representing Cambridge College. <laughs> Thank you. And hello. I do not know four simple yet powerful questions that have different implications for different people. When I was 14, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to publish numerous books, be on bestsellers lists, and of course, become rich. Family and friends told me that it was difficult to be a writer in Zambia because the environment was not conducive. However, I did not believe them, so I continued to dream. As a 15-year-old who was naive and innocent, I thought I would conquer the world. Then I grew up, and with it, the carpet of innocence was swept right under my feet. Something else happens when you grow up. You begin to attract things called bills. Water bills, <laughs> car bills, <laughs> rental bills. And soon, I had to shelve my writing dreams. However, creativity not expressed can be very suffocating for the creative soul. So I had to find my way to writing. And in 2012, I finished my first manuscript. When people asked me what I wanted to do with it or how I would get it published, I replied, I do not know, because I did not know where to take it, how to get it published, how to finance it, or what the first steps would be. And this led me on a four-year journey to finding the answers, a journey that finished in January 2016 when I self-published my first book, Hired, <laughs> Find the Job, Keep the Job, and Quit the Job. As my book hit bookstores and I began to appear in the press, the radio and TV, other writers began to send me messages, call me, emails, to find out how I got published or how I got my book out there. They began to ask me if I could read their manuscripts. They also asked me and found inspiration in what I was doing that they could begin to write once again. And this was the birth of Butali Readers and Writer Studio a startup company that helps writers navigate a challenging publishing industry, an industry where the reading culture is dwindling, where publishers will not look at your work unless it is academic, where the prices of publishing and printing books is so exorbitant that you can't even think about it. What we do, however, is tell writers that yes, the challenges are there, but there are opportunities as well. There is digital format, which is almost unexploited in Zambia and much of Africa. You also have print on demand, and you can publish outside Zambia at far cheaper costs. They do not have to take four years in their journey, because with us, 
we can tell them that yes, in an hour's consultation, you can find your way and it can be easier. For most of these riders, it is not about being rich, neither is it about being famous. All they want is to share their ideas, stories, and experiences with the rest of the world. However, as long as their work is still at the manuscript stage, it will never or may never be read. This journey is not just about what we do at Butale Readers and Writers Studio, because I believe you too can have a part to play in it. Each time you read a book, I believe a writer's heartbeat beats in gratitude. You prevent the book industry from flatlining. But most importantly, you might be saving yourselves. Because one day you might be asked about your dreams, aspirations, and goals. And you might have to answer like I did. I do not know. And you will have to chip away at that knot in that sentence to get to your opportunity. And the hammer you might need to do that might just be a book. Thank you. and called Papa. It wasn't until years later that I understood what had actually been done to me. I was late. My perpetrator would never be brought to justice. Mm. But then years later, as a young adult, I realized that this story wasn't just mine. It wasn't about me, but it was about thousands of women like me. Many of you in this room today probably share a story like mine. 70% of women in Uganda are sexually abused at least once in their lifetimes. Yes, 70%. It was also then that I realized that just like my perpetrators, our systems, political, social, and yes, even religious systems, fail us many times. We trust them to design policies that will give us access to better health care, education. But then, we wake up to find that our national resources have been plundered and we've been robbed blind by the very systems that we trust. <coughs> it also dawned on me that if I wanted to see change, I couldn't just sit back and wait for the system to do something about it. I had to get up and do something myself. It is for that reason but I'm now a business and social entrepreneur, empowering women in my country, particularly disadvantaged rural farmers, buying their plantain at competitive prices. It is just my way of giving the power back to women in a society where almost everything is controlled by the men. <coughs> Through my foundation, Mama's Jewels, I help girls who have been sexually abused find their purpose, heal, recover, find that them that they lost before they were abused. Because I know that you have to heal first before you're able to create change in your communities and impact the lives of others. Because I believe that every girl is a gem. My next step after the Mandela Washington Fellowship is to begin my journey, a PhD in public policy. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to be able to change policy right from the grassroots, because I know it is imperative that we have policy change in order to protect our daughters, our jewels in our communities. We are all business people here, but let's just not be business people for ourselves. 
Let's be business people who are going to use our businesses to change the lives of those that are not in position to change their lives. Yes, I'm challenging each and every one of you here, whether you're in the private or public sector, do something with your business. Let it just not be about you. Let it be about everybody else, especially the jewels in your communities, because it is these jewels who form the bedrock of our communities in the future. So, my fellow fellows, proud to be, fo f proud to be presidential fellows, bearing the name tag of Mandela, President Barack Obama, what are you going to do when you get back home to protect the jewels in your communities? How are you going to use your businesses for good? That is my question to you all. You have come this far. Go home and show them. Create change. Thank you. representing Drake University. I'm an architect and a very passionate social entrepreneur. But how does an architect fall deeply in love with social impact? Let me tell you my love story. It's a story of mentors. At 13, I had two major life problems. One was the fact that I was being raised up by a single mother and we had myriads of financial challenges. And two, I had a crush on this girl. <laughs> and I really needed to impress her. By the time I was 14, I started my first business to solve these two problems. I made handmade cards and cakes to impress the girl, and I commercialized this selling to family, friends, and neighbors to make money for my family. And I did this because I met a mentor by name Pastor Chris Oyakilome. And he taught me that problems are not the end, but they are an opportunity to change the world. He said, success is all about finding a human need and reaching out to meet it. At this point, it was my need. At 16, it was time for college, and I was obsessed with lines and colors and precision and design. So I decided to study architecture. While in school, I had to work. By the time I was done with my course, I had raked in four years work experience. On my fifth year, the firm approached me to be a junior partner. I did this, and I was bored. I was still obsessed with design, but I wasn't sure I was cut out to keep designing buildings. At this point, I met my next mentor. His name is Mr. Kola Ainor. And he taught me that it's not just enough to see problems as opportunities and take a hold of them, but I also have a responsibility to make opportunities available to others. He said life is all about impact and expansion, and together, We've created Nigeria's premier full-service tech incubator out of the heart of Nigeria, Abuja. And we'll be accepting our first cohort of startups in a couple of days. I still co-own my architectural practice, and I run a nonprofit that helps young people see opportunities by organizing trainings in leadership, success, and entrepreneurship for high school kids and university undergrads. At Drake University during the Mandela Washington Fellowship, I met young, inspiring Africans doing amazing things, taking advantage of Africa's problems and making them opportunities. I met people like Peter in Kenya, where there's a serious drought problem. But he sees it as an opportunity to create water harvesting systems, opportunity. I met Rosalia from Namibia, where there is a serious waste problem. 
But she has decided to take all that waste and make fertilizers an energy opportunity. I met Fernando from Angola, oh, yes. where there's a rising unemployment rate among young people. Problem. But he sees it as an opportunity to build a virtual incubator to help young people build businesses. I met Kadi from Senegal, where women and children have limited access to health care. Problem. But she sees it as an opportunity to build health centers. And I know every one of us here, Nelson Mandela, Mandela Washington Fellows, are taking Africa's problems and making them opportunities. But that's not enough. We have a responsibility to make opportunity available to others, to the next generation. Imagine if every Mandela Washington Fellow, past, present, and future, will go back home and mentor just 20 high school kids in one year. Over the next 10 years, we would have mentored one million young African leaders. Now take a moment with me and imagine. Imagine one million Hadis building health centers and Peters building water harvesting plants and Fernando's creating jobs and Rosalia's converting waste into energy. Imagine one million yous and one million me's. What kind of Africa would we have created? So, the fellows at Drake decided that we're going to go back home and pioneer Say Yes clubs in high school. Say Yes meaning shaping Africa through youth engagement and sustainable development using the resources on the Yali platform. And I'd like to end my speech with this quote by Nelson Mandela. He said, every once in a while, a generation is called upon to be great. He said, you, and I added, we could be that great generation. Why don't you all just say yes? Western University. Can we all stand? Can we all stand up, please, quickly? Can everybody stand up? Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Okay, you can all sit down. I wanted to see if you would listen. <laughs> Every right implies a responsibility, every opportunity an obligation, and every possession a duty. This quote by John Rockefeller resonates strongly with me because it highlights that with every opportunity comes the obligation to first make a choice and then the responsibility to make the most of this choice. What is opportunity? The meaning of opportunity in our personal lives is something which must always be approached with an open mind. There are clear instances when opportunities present themselves in an obvious and positive manner, such as the opportunity to apply for this fellowship. On the other hand, we can also find opportunities hidden in failure and things we have no control over, such as where we come from and what we were never given. I am going to talk about the opportunities that were presented to me firstly through failure and secondly through what I was never given. <laughs> this exact time in 2014, I was based in London and extremely miserable working at one of the accountancy firms. During this period and for three years before this, I had applied and been rejected every single time by what I thought were more lucrative jobs in investment banking and consulting. It was difficult. Why didn't anybody want to hire me? Was it Juju? <laughs> <laughs> Although I did not realize this then, this failure to secure what I thought I was looking for 
presented me with the opportunity to dig deeper <laughs> and make a choice on whether my future was better placed in the United Kingdom or my home country of Zimbabwe. My heart told me that despite the challenges back home, the odds of me one day making a meaningful impact were high at home. Yes. After returning back at the end of 2014, the first thing I realized was that I now had the responsibility to make the most of this choice. Today, I have ultimately been blessed with the opportunity to participate in this esteemed fellowship and create lifelong friendships with all of you, especially yeah. the Northwesterners. The second example is that of an opportunity I was never afforded. My paternal grandparents, Itai and Joina Mutasa, died on the same day, on the 28th of March, 1994. I was three and have no memory of them. To this day, if there is one thing I could wish for, it would simply be to have a conversation with them. This deep yearning I always had to know my grandparents is what provided the initial opportunity for me to build a passion for history and having their undocumented story documented. My grandfather and his siblings were very active as nationalists during our Zimbabwe, then known as Rhodesia liberation struggle. In 2013, I reached out to a historian and spent the following two years helping her document his story. On the 4th of March, 2015, this historian presented a public lecture at the London School of Economics, and the theme was nationalism in Africa through the experiences of my grandfather. I never cry, but I remember shedding tears alone in my room that day. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, we have to open our minds to all the seemingly hidden possibilities in our lives. The most hidden opportunity lies in the future of our beloved continent of Africa. Yes. Yes. In the words of Peter Drucker, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So let us all stand together and accept the responsibility yes. to ourselves, our peers, and our homes, and make Africa a place we can all be proud of. Yes. Thank you very much. Stephen, representing Purdue University. It is said that opportunity knocks but once. It is also said that opportunities multiply as they are seized. This is my story of seizing an unexpected opportunity. Growing up with a single peasant mother in a refugee camp in Central Africa Republic, I learned poverty by experience. I can't tell you how many nights I slept on empty stomach. So I used to wash my clothes without soap, and usually in the night, so I would wear the next day. My one luxury was meeting under some trees, which we called primary school. I expected to complete primary school and no more. One day, coming back from the farm with my mother, carrying firewood on my head through some bushy path, a priest narrowly knocked me down with his motorbike. He rushed to pick me up, took a deep breath, looked hard at my mother, and told her he would take care of me and send me to school. It is said that the best things in life are unexpected. I went to a good school in Uganda instead of nowhere. In a classroom with walls, electricity, good teachers, I was totally in a new world. But one thing I never forgot was where I came from. Yes. And this propelled me throughout my undergraduate studies like fire. In 2011, I came back to Yambio, my town in South Sudan with a degree. I was shocked 
but not surprised to see that many students were completing primary school but had no access to secondary education. It was a long night for me as it made me remember where I came from. I felt an urge in me to do something about this situation, so I shared the concern with a few friends who had gone to school like me. With nothing but five friends, we started a secondary school and called it King's College. Wow. Oh. We used some unfinished building as classroom, taught by ourselves because we could not afford hiring teachers, and our pocket money provided the basic necessities. Two months down the road, however, the situation was getting tough and tougher. Lack of resources was hitting us mercilessly. So we decided to give up and close the school. We had reached the peak of quitting. So we began to prepare on how to tell the students, and we couldn't do it. How could we give up on them? So I pleaded with my colleagues to hang on for a while. Slowly, we kept moving on. In the last two years, our school has a growing enrollment of over 500 students. And we have graduated two cohorts so far. The school now has learned from the community, better classrooms, full-time teachers. Opportunities for secondary education is now available in the community. But when I look back, I can't believe how far we have gone. We are contributing to the first sustainable development goal and combating the low literacy rate of 32% in South Sudan. But I didn't do it because of goals or numbers. I did it to multiply the opportunity I had seized. It is said by Nelson Mandela that education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. As Mandela Washington fellows, we have been educated in ways that our traditional systems cannot. How will you leverage your work through this education to impact Africa? As for me, extending education opportunities for fellows in my Africa is my prime goal, apart from my farm business. Not all of you will start a school. You don't have to. But every time you answer the question, what did you do as a fellow with your whole heart, you are educating. Every time you see injustice and bring in new ideas to put it right, you are educating. It can be big or small. Come on. But you multiply the opportunity you have seen. Today, I multiply mine by the number in this room. Development, democracy, peace, and security in Africa will come much faster if you never miss an opportunity to educate. Yes. It is said by President Obama, yes, we can. And that is the spirit we are taking back to Africa. Thank you. representing Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. So picture this. Africa is exciting. Things have changed. Economies are growing. There's a lot of economic activity. Social cohesion is normal. Children, communities, societies are optimistic. They're hopeful. They can see possibilities for themselves. The future looks bright. Intra-Africa trade is happening. It's a reality. Yeah. Opportunity is business as usual. Equality is the order of business. And good ethics just makes business sense. Let me welcome you to 2026. So my name is Murwesi Ramunyai. I'm an impact entrepreneur from South Africa. 
and uh, I work in energy, particularly renewable energy. But let's talk about 2026 and what made this thing happen. What could have been the change agents, the catalysts that made this a possibility? Wisdom tells us that for you to understand your history, I mean your past, I mean your current <laughs> scenario, you need to look into your history. But we also know that um, history does craft and shape our future. So let me take you back. I think it was around 2016. If I think carefully, I think it was around June and July <laughs> in uh, New, New Jersey. New Jersey, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> and uh, at Rutgers University, 25 business young, young business leaders came together. They were pursuing their own individual business interests. They were there to craft their own future. But um, as they deliberated, they realized that actually some of the problems on the continent are bigger than just one of us yeah. each. And some of the problems perhaps um, need to be tackled differently. They then decided to take the opportunity to leverage on their collective power to do something bigger and more impactful. And as a result of this, they formed a corporation. Thank you. And it's called a corporation. <laughs> So this corporation's mission is simple. It's to actually change Africa through enterprise. And it's to use technology and innovation to give access to opportunities to change Africa. And to allow Africans to change their own scenario themselves, by themselves, through their own resources and through their own collective powers. They also decided to use networks. For example, they were in New Jersey with Rutgers University. And it was an opportunity to actually work with some of the great minds there. So one of the first problems, of course, energy. We know energy is a big problem in Africa. And we also know what energy can do. Energy can unlock opportunities for economic growth. Energy can allow, energy can allow countries to industrialize. And when you industrialize, you create jobs. Yes. And when you've got jobs, you have sustainable livelihoods. Yes. So at the same time, when you have energy, then you can also eliminate health problems presented by what's happening right now. You can also give access to education in a much more sustainable way. And also what you do is you then reduce the dependence on biomass, which is unsustainable. We know very well that uh, wood fuel, fuel, for example, is used the most. Nigeria, for example, uses over 40 million tons of wood fuel annually for, for energy um, to, to cook and to provide heat. This is not sustainable. So something else must be done. But as life would have it, there's always a you know, silver lining because we then came to learn that one man's trash can be another man's treasure. Yes. And um, we met an incredible innovator and inventor, and, and um, he's developed what you call spec fuel. Spec fuel is a piece of technology that transforms post-recycling waste into energy. This is waste that is not recyclable anymore. This is waste that is not reusable anymore. This is waste that is just destined for the landfill. And we decided to go for it. In fact, the corporation's first project is to actually pilot this in Nigeria. And uh, we're fundraising and, and getting that going. Why is this important? It's important because, one, it shows that in Africa, we can stop just exporting raw materials only, only to re-import it again, but we can actually beneficiate, process, and consume our own products. Yeah. It actually shows that we can create jobs. It shows that we can, we can, we can create economies that are sustainable. It's also important because this project is not only viable, it's also scalable, yeah. and it's also transferable. Great. So if 25 of us could do something like that, just from being together in two months, can you imagine what a 1,000 of us can do? I implore you to take the opportunity, and I thank you. One more speaker left, and then we'll open up for some question and answer from our panel. Um, last but not least is Javron Epstein representing Virginia Commonwealth <laughs> University. Do I just tuck this in? in your pocket? Can I put it in my pocket? Is this thing on? Can you hear me? OK, I arrived in America. And three big things happened to me that I want to share with you. On the first day, I got hit by a car. I'm fine. Um, 
Two weeks later, I get bitten by the second most venomous spider in America. I'm still fine. <laughs> and the third thing is, I came to America to realize why I was African. On the, on the second day that I arrived, we had, arri we had arri arrived at a restaurant. And at the restaurant, I sat down with my, with my peers. And someone came up to me and said to me, I'm sorry, sir, you can't sit here. This is for the fellows only. <laughs> And I understand it, and you know what? That, then it realized, I asked myself, I said, Jeff. Okay. Um, that's the fourth thing. Um, so I decided, I said, oh, I need to. I'll just speak loudly, it's fine, don't worry. Can you hear me now? Okay, can fix it. No, no, leave it, leave it. Leave, leave the mic. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. I decided to write myself a letter to explain to myself what my life meant, what my life means in Africa, and what your lives mean. I was born, so I'm going to read this letter to you because it's important. It puts my feelings down and it'll keep me straight and narrow. I was born into a life of prosperity, a life that offered me the ability to acquire crucial skills and an understanding of not only my life, but the world around me and what it has to offer. I lived the dream that every parent in this room wants for their child. I attended private schools and I lived a childhood free of persecution and marginalization. I was surrounded by support and sheltered to the malicious past that my very neighbors in this room had experienced. My life has been filled with opportunities. If I was to say that these opportunities were given to me, I would be lying. What I can say is that I was afforded the ability to understand what an opportunity is and to take advantage. As you are essentially who you create yourself to be and all that occurs in your life is a result of your own making. What this all means is that I was afforded a special right this is the definition of privilege. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My father, a boy that grew up in an orphanage in Cape Town, a boy whose education was in a language not of his own, a boy who was snuck into South Africa on the back of a cattle truck fleeing from Poland with his two siblings and his mother, a boy whose grandparents had been captured and slaughtered at Auschwitz a boy who witnessed his father being murdered at a young age whilst trying to protect his family, a boy who was taught to beg to spare his life, a boy who was born into a world created by Nazi Germany. This Jew grew up in a world where he was tormented, marginalized, and abused. This boy had to fight his way through life. This boy was fueled by hate, resentment, and anger. This boy who lived a life defined by uncertainty and discomfort. A boy who will never settle. A boy who would only get to know the word opportunity too late in life. This boy had no privilege. What these two cases teach us is that opportunity to change the very world we live in is just one generation away. I am not my father. I cannot talk of how to sacrifice, how to move on, how to forgive, as I did not have to. My words and my experience do not represent the challenge that every single one of you face. Where I do talk from is the easy part. It is not the journey, but the destination. We can change not only the lives of our children, but the lives of all Africans, and even more, all marginalized human beings. The people who sit in this room today are the future. They hold the solution to the broken world we live in today. I am African, and yes, even though I'm slightly lighter than most people. <laughs> I am African because I understand that I am part of the solution, but also part of the problem. Only when you know where you are coming from can you understand where you're going. My privilege will not be my silence. It will not make me part of the problem. Our opportunity is now. 
never will we, will we be more ready than we are today. My, my father understood this. He understood what opportunity meant. He sacrificed his life so that I could have both love and respect. Opportunity gives us hope. As Africans, we need to stand together and we need to create the world that we want to live in. Thank you. another round of applause. It's worth mentioning as well that for each individual up here representing today, they're here because their peers at each of their campuses selected them to come and to share their story. And I think that it's representative clearly of the wonderful work they're doing, but also the, the inspiring people they've been around in their time at the universities. Um, we have time for some question and answers, and I wonder if there's already one here. But Justine, yeah. there's a mic that's coming around. Well, uh, my name is Fusi from Tanzania, and I was placed at the presidential precinct. I would love to ask the panel uh, a question about foreign direct investment. Uh, we have a lot of uh, natural resources, uh, including gas and oil, and uh, deposits of uranium, for instance, in Africa, which can be used to electrify Africa and to create uh, more energy in Africa. But the problem uh, facing the energy industry has been uh, 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 most of the uh, natives in Africa are not able to do the foreign uh, for, uh, to, to do the direct investment. Instead, we are seeing a lot of foreign direct investment. So my question is. Uh, what is, are the barriers that you see that can be turned into opportunities by young Africans on investing directly on exploration of these uh, uh, resources which can be used uh, to create more energy in Africa? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone want to take that question? Yeah. I'll take it. Um, you know, it's, it's almost precisely what, what uh, I mentioned in my, my presentation, is that we need to invest in technologies and innovations to solve our own problems. We need to start using institutions of higher learning a little bit more. We need to start commissioning PhD students to go and do research and come back with technologies that we can patent and actually use to solve our own problems in a way that they work in Africa. Because right now what we do is we import other people's uh, you know, processes and other technologies and other you know, innovations, and they don't work as efficiently as they should. Yes. You know? So we have the resources, but we have to find a way to process those minerals and those resources. And the only way to do that is through research and development and in, is into coming up with those innovations. But we have to work with, with, with our people and we have to put the money down. Let's support those students. Let's just get, you know, um, investing into 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 R and D. Let's take the gentleman in the the middle here. Hey, good morning to everybody. My name is Velile Tube. I was at Drake University. And I'm a marketer. <laughs> <laughs> to the third speaker, Mr. Mimshek, you spoke about say yes. Kindly explain. I, I gather that's a, a, an acronym or an abbreviation. Kindly explain what exactly that is. OK. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. OK, say yes means shaping Africa through youth engagement in sustainable development. And the idea is to get the young people, so right now Africa has the youngest generation, right? And the projection is we have about 200 million young people right now, and we're gonna have about a billion in, by 2040, 2050. And what this means is for a long time, Africa has been driven by the older generation and we've had a lot of problems. This is one time that Africa has the opportunity to 
allow its young people drive it. And not just the continent allowing its young people, but its young people coming up to say, we will drive our continent. And Say Yes gives us that opportunity. So fellows from the Mandela Washington Fellowship, for example, who have been impacted by numerous information and innovation and interactions with Americans and among ourselves, have a responsibility to go back and impact the next generation, high school kids in particular. So the deal is 2050 is about 30 something years from now. The leaders who will be presidents and senators and ministers and owners of corporations in that year are in high school right now. So what Sayers just simply does is it gives us the opportunity to go back to high school, pioneer a club that will have about 20 kids in it, use the resources that we have on the Yali Learns, things about leadership and entrepreneurship and communication and women empowerment and Yali Goes Green, and then organize clubs where we could transfer this information to the next generation so that these ones grow with the information. They grow with the mindsets. They grow seeing Africa as a home of opportunity and not problems. And then I guess we have a future. Thank you. Thank you. I'll mention as well for, for those who haven't yet visited, the Yali Learns table will be out for the whole of the week and they have fabulous opportunities and it's a great way for young people to plug in. I know this side of the room is feeling a little neglected, so the young woman in, bl in blue there would be great. <laughs> Thank you for recognizing me. Um, my, my question is actually directed to Violet. Firstly, your story is inspiring. Your bravery has touched me deeply. Um, Chimamanda Adichie, the Nigerian uh, feminist, said that we, the worst mistake we can do to girls is that they master the art of pretense as women. What is it that business can do? Is there an opportunity for business to inspire young women to speak out about their story, to harness um, you know, protection in some sort of form? Is there, do you see that there's an opportunity? And I'd also like to hear from Jev, as you know, being in the school environment, is there an opportunity for business and police to work hand in hand? Thank you very much for that kind. Um, yes, there is opportunity for business to be able to do that in all of our communities. When we keep quiet about the things that are happening to us simply because society says it's improper to talk about them or that it's embarrassing to talk about them, it becomes a cancer that eats away at the very fabric of our society. And then it destroys our girls. Many of our girls are into prostitution drugs, early marriages, some are even committing suicide. Just because nobody is willing to listen, or their mother tells them that you're embarrassing the family, sure. keep quiet. So what happens to your mental health? Definitely it's going down the drain. As business people, we carry a certain amount of influence in our communities. Right from your very customers, Right from the core values of your companies, you can put that in there that you, you can commit that your company is going to protect the girls in your community. Because I imagine, for example, uh, what I did when I was still very active in the retail and distribution industry, I made sure that 90% of my workforce were girls. And some of this had not even gone to school. I had girls driving the trucks that were distributing the merchandise to, uh, to these business people that could not afford to go to the cities to buy them themselves. I had girls running this whole thing. Right now, the women that I work with, I work with about 200 women. I could employ men as well, and I appreciate the men in the room, yes, and the men everywhere. But I am speaking for the women because Many times, our society tells the women to keep quiet. Yes. It tells us that we belong in the kitchen. Oh, no, we don't. We don't belong there. We belong here with you. So as business people, I think that if you inserted it into your core values as a company and spoke about it, your customers would listen to you. Your audience would listen to you. And if in the little things that you keep doing day by day, 
you incorporate these values, soon you'll find that it, there'll be a ripple effect. So don't worry if you're not able to impact so many lives at the same time. I just need you to remember that every life you change, every day, will eventually have a ripple effect that will, yes. you know? My, thank you. I think before we take another question, there was also uh, a point to, to you as well about the schools. Um, okay. and how in the school systems we might also um, I, help as well. Okay, so I own a group of private schools in Cape Town and we are expanding into Africa. They're for private school children, but we've also got an informal school. Um, I've, I've always had a belief that everything must balance. So you can't, without money, you can't do anything. Um, our schools work on the basis that we charge a premium for those that can afford the premium in those areas. And for the people that can't afford to go to school, they don't pay school fees. The reality, though, is that without education, we're fooling ourselves. You know, a bird doesn't struggle to fly. So the reality is if you're not educated, you're not going to compete in a world where everyone can fly. Um, it's, our, it's, us, it's our responsibility sort of as adults and as future leaders to understand that education is the most important thing in Africa. To educate ourselves, educate women, educate men, educate races. And if we, if we can understand that and we move together, there's nothing we can't do. That's great. Tengen, do you have any, do you have any other comments in that or other educator in the, the group? Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Maybe just a, a little experience from what we are doing in South Sudan. Um, like I said, we have a low literacy rate of 32%, and that is very dangerous for a country. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's worse among women with 25%. So in our school, we have given special consideration for uh, girl-child uh, girl education. And uh, we, we make sure that from the community, uh, besides students who come from far, uh, students from the community are given opportunity to come and learn. So uh, the surrounding communities, we have uh, programs every year to get some on who are not able to pay school fees. They can still come and learn in their school. So that is especially uh, focusing on, on uh, girl-child education, just to make sure there is a balance, because all of us understand without education, uh, there's no future for a country. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? This gentleman in the colorful shirt here would like to ask. Thank you. My question goes to Tapfuma. You know, each year we see our young African people leaving the continent to go abroad, to study, to get new skills, to get PhDs. But at the end of these trainings, most of the time, the vast majority of them they don't come back to Africa. They end up working there. What can, you, can we do to convince them to come back? And I know that you face the same situations. So what it takes for you to come back to Africa and build the continent? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Etienne. I think for me, there's, there's two sides to that, that question. One side is practical reality. Then the other side is what can our country do? On practical reality, what I've noticed is a lot of us go abroad, everyone comes and they say, I'm gonna study, work for two years, then go back home and change the country, <laughs> right? You start working, you start earning money and your lifestyle adjusts to what you earn. People then get married, you have mortgages, you have kids. Each year you stay, you're accumulating responsibilities which make the choice to go back difficult. For me, what personally worked for me is, I only did one year working in the UK. I hadn't gotten used to earning a lot of money. I had no wife, I had no kids. So my first, from a practical reality is, when you accumulate responsibilities out there, it's difficult, that's, that's a fact. But on the other side, I'll speak for Zimbabwe, for example. Some of our countries, the way we perceive the diaspora, Diaspora sometimes does not get the same uh, respect or, or measure of importance. Like our politicians have an attitude, uh, you guys are out there you're enjoying life. So sometimes people feel they're not as welcome. So I think from a country point of view, creating a, an accepting environment that hey, people outside are contributing, the money they send via MoneyGram, Western Union, that's how a lot of Zimbabweans survive through some of the toughest times. So if you can just create in the minds that people outside 
please get whatever you get and then come back. We will accept you. Whereas when you come back, like for me, my first year back, everyone at work would, was saying, are you, when are you going back? Yeah? <laughs> Zoom is too hard for you, eh? You, know? <laughs> you, 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 speak, you speak the Queen's English. So you, you need to understand that that also doesn't help give people the feeling that you're wanted. So that's, that's my response. There's a young woman over here in the front. Hi, my name is Esther Sola. I'm from the DRC. Um, my question is to speaker number one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> <laughs> so, the South African one. Uh, your pro no. More yeah. easy. <laughs> yes. All right. So your project on energy. I just want to find out. I mean, it's a great project, and you guys worked on it together. I just want to know why are you doing your Project, your pilot project in Nigeria. Why is that the country that you chose for your pilot project? All right. So um, when we did some research, um, it then transpired that Nigeria is one of the countries that have the highest and the most um, solid waste. Um, you know, they produce the highest, one of the highest, one of the highest solid waste um, yeah, producing countries in, in, in the continent. So you need a lot of waste to make this um, you know, uh, also viable for you. But other than that, um, on, the, on the commercial side as well, uh, you know, for example, Europe consumes a lot of uh, charcoal, for example, and they get a lot of it from Africa. Africa produces at least 40, supplies 40% of Europe's um, charcoal. This is, for example, last year they consumed 800,000 tons. But Nigeria is the most um, uh, uh, supplying country in that whole 40%. So financially and commercially, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and we just feel for a pilot, we'll probably get uh, scale a little bit more quickly. But it's a pilot only, and we are going to be rolling it out to the rest of the countries as well, where we are. Okay. Um, this gentleman in the front. Uh, my name is Ivan Kalonda. I come from the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, the heart of Africa. <laughs> um, my question is addressed to the, the, the first uh, person, to, to Peter. He talked about his book. Uh, uh, he wrote a book. So I want him to tell us a bit about that book, what it is about, and how it can help uh, uh, us as fellows. And we have, you know, many of us have thought of writing books. But, you know, we only have titles and outlines, and years are going, you know, so, and you have been able to write and publish, so what kind of advice or encouragement can you give us so we may be able to write our books? Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, my book is titled Hired, Find the Job, Keep the Job, and Quit the Job. So basically, it's targeted towards university students, graduates, and the general job seeker to help them navigate the job market. And part of the things I talk about is how you volunteer can actually make an impact in society and help you get the job. In terms of writing, the best advice is to start. They always say the difficult part about writing is the first sentence. And once you get that out of the way, it's very easy to, to start. In terms of publishing and writing, yes, it is a difficult industry. But you have to know the right people or the right channels to go through in order to save you costs. For example, you don't have to publish 1,000 copies today. You can publish 10. You can publish 100 and see how they sell. You also have the digital market. For example, on Amazon, as mobile phones become cheaper, smartphones specifically, and internet gets cheaper, it will now be possible for people to publish and buy books online. And those are some of the avenues that writers can use to actually get their books and messages out there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have some questions in the back, and it's hard for us to see who's there. I'm going to, the, there's a gentleman by the stand in the back that's waving his hand around. I'm... Sorry, Justine, I'm making you run around. Oh, okay, <laughs> Thank you, the future leader, future business entrepreneurs. And I'm, I'm Daniel Tuli from Uganda. 
I work in the public sector with the revenue service. Um, the together attitude which we have, which I've listened to one of the panelists say, we need to work together. From, the, from your perspective and all your countries, where you're coming from, uh, I don't know, your engagement with the, with, the, with the government, working together, being engaged in like organization like Chamber of Commerce, where you put your, your ideas about the policies which affect your businesses and how the government can help you do better business. Because we see, in my country, you see ambitious business coming up. By the end of one or two years, they have gone down. But when they already have good business plans, just because they're not working together and finding better policies which can help them create sustainable businesses. What are you doing in your countries to do this, engaging the government? So I guess maybe for, for a few of you from different countries, a sense of what networks and supports are you using to build your businesses, and then what are you doing to contribute to more access for other entrepreneurs uh, to find supports and um, opportunities? Um, it, it, anybody can take that. Yeah, do, Peter, do you want to start? Okay. And then? I'll, I'll start. For example, I'll talk about the writers um, in Zambia specifically. If you want to engage government as an individual, you will hardly be heard. But if you are a group, an organization, a company, your voices make much more impact, and therefore you can be heard. So that's the way I encourage even other writers. Like, let's form groups, let's form collectives, and let's shout, because then our voices will be heard. Because if I shout alone as a single writer, they will not pay me attention. But if a 1,000 or 10 writers march and say, we need cheaper papers, for example, to publish books in Zambia, somebody will listen. The press will come. The TVs will pick it up. Someone will tweet about it. But if I'm alone, no one will do that. So therefore, the encouragement is to be in groups, cooperate, and work together in order to make government listen. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel, okay. did you have some yes. thoughts? OK, um, Nigeria is a very, I'm from Nigeria. Nigeria is a very big country. And there are lots of initiatives built by the government and by the private sector to spawn entrepreneurship. We have various um, incubators. I co-own one of them called Ventures Platform, which helps young people in technology to start up businesses. But what I want to talk about today is not about the structures that the private sector or the government have to spawn entrepreneurship. But I want to talk about a pan-Africanism. Mm. I think we all need to, we all already think we respect our countries. I think I never thought about myself as an African until I came here for this program. Yeah. I knew myself as a Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And in Nigeria, you knew yourself as your tribe. Yes. But, but there is something much more than just your country, and that's Pan-Africa. And mm -hmm. the fact that your business probably failed, or an idea failed in Nigeria doesn't mean it, will, it won't succeed in Zimbabwe. So one of the things I've been doing on this program is to find out about opportunities in other countries. There are a couple of solutions that you already have in Gabon that is needed in Senegal, or something that's already done in South Africa that you need to implement in Sudan. So the, the deal is, I think we should keep this network running and talk to each other. With technology, a lot of people would say, OK, but the government wouldn't allow us export businesses. But guess what? With technology, there are no barriers. There are no borders. Uber is an American company making tons of money from Nigeria. No borders. The same way someone can create a business anywhere in Africa and export it to any other part of Africa and make it work. Let's all think Pan-African. Let's all think Africa. And let's think about building Africa, not just building individual com countries. Let's take another question. You've been patiently waiting. <laughs> Uh, my question is for the Zimbabwean uh, young man. He may, um, I wanted to find out from him. Um, I was reading about Zimbabwe the other day. I discovered that they have 95% unemployment. And he's been part of this fellowship, this amazing fellowship. And I wanted to find out from the past six weeks, what relationships have you created? What strategies are you going to take home? Are you going to take to your country to change and make it a better place? Thank you very much, young lady from Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, 
it's, it's a very good question. I think the issue of what strategies, what are we going to do to impact such a large figure of 95% unemployment? I think the first thing is I like being practical. Um, change is not always a whole country. You can change in your own personal situation. So the company I, where I work at personally, it's called TSL. We, we hire graduate interns. They add no value to us, over 10 a year, graduates, right? The amount we invest in training them and what we get out of it does not correlate. But it's a commitment we've said that all these local universities in Zimbabwe, graduates need to be given an opportunity. Because you can't have a situation where most of our people graduate with first classes in electrical engineering and they don't have an opportunity. Now, I'm sorry, I don't have the solution to solving 95% unemployment. But in our own small way, where we provide graduates in their penultimate year, and when they start work, an opportunity for employment, even though it's 10 a year, we're playing our part to give some people an option. On top of that, in terms of uh, at a bigger level, you know, this is now businesses, uh, government. My, my, my personal sense is the challenge is sometimes businessmen, uh, we as businessmen, we know how to extract value out of country, out of resources, out of situations, and make money for ourselves. But sometimes we don't know how to empower others. I think it's a mindset situation. We have big businessmen from Zimbabwe. Due to challenges, some have done well, but have either gone to live outside, or they have not, um, how, how best can I put it? They have not, uh, in terms of the response to, to, to employment and the challenges of people socially, I think we could do better. It's a mindset shift. But for me, I think it's in my own small way, in the business I work for, the graduates we give an opportunity, maybe 10, it's not the 95%, but we're doing our part. Thank you. OK, we have a question here in the white shirt. And then I'll get back to the side of the room. Hey, so, OK. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask questions, but if I stand there asking questions, I think I'm going to ask more. Um, my brother from South Sudan, yeah. I saw your story. Sorry, uh, my name is Gisten Ondere Kanga. I'm from Congo Brazzaville. I heard you talking about education. That's very good. That's why we need in Africa. But which kind of education? Because Africa right now is suffering. We're having some people who have been finished from universities. All they know is just speaking a better English and better French. What do you think? Now, you guys have made the project of a higher and secondary schools. But what do you think after that? where those young ladies and the young boys will go because it's not just giving them secondary and higher school education and leave them alone after that. So let not they create schools to destroy this next generation that we need to save. But the suggestion, or if I can suggest something from you is that from now on, think also our own how those people will learn some skills that will help them to do something from other resources that we have in Africa. Thank you so much. So a, a question about what's next after yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we all understand uh, education is basic and very important, and very fundamental for the growth of a country. And in most countries, uh, education is a priority of the government. But uh, in our case, because of uh, the gap we had, we established the school and it is running. That was what we could um, manage by that time. Now, coming to Yale is uh, an eye-opener, OK? And this question you have raised is not only mine. It is for us in Africa. So going back, we now need to figure out how are we going to, because unemployment is a big problem in every country, or in most countries in Africa. How are we going to influence our education system, especially uh, tertiary education systems, 
to be job creators instead of job seekers. So uh, my, my assignment from here is to go back, since I'm uh, running a secondary school, to know what is after and how can we integrate uh, vocational schools or br uh, bring in systems which can educate students after secondary school into job creators. That is my part in South Sudan. But you and other African fellows here have also a task to do in their countries. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, here, while here in the US, I visited a particular architectural firm. And I was amazed because they dedicated about a quarter of their office to a program they run for high school kids. So every year, high school kids apply from a public high school close to the office. And they, they are able to take about 20 kids for a whole year that would come work out of their office after school. Now what happens is these high school kids learn about business, they learn about entrepreneurship, they learn a little about architecture, and then they also teach the workers about how to design with kids in mind. Now what this does is it empowers those kids. Every one of us here run businesses, and we have gone through the process of starting up a business which is difficult. And there's one thing you know, it's very lonely. But if we, almost every African country has a high unemployment rate, can we divert people's attention from looking for jobs to creating one? And can we mentor the next generation of entrepreneurs? Can we get to colleges or get to people that are looking for jobs and try to figure out a way for them to learn a skill maybe from your business and then build their own business without thinking about the fact that they might be competitors? I think the solution is in all our hands. Okay. Um, Hame, over here in the vest. Hi. Uh, my name is Hame Banzi uh, from Botswana. I was at Dartmouth College. We love you, Amy. Well done, Violet. Um, thank you all. I think your honesty was really amazing. Um, my question is primarily around lobbying. Um, I think a lot of what we want to get done, a lot of change we want to see requires uh, influencing policy, right? Um, we had an amazing session at Dartmouth uh, with uh, Kawala, who ran for presidency in uh, Cameroon, first woman to run for uh, president. And she spoke a lot about our political apathy as business people, which a lot of us really did, uh, to be honest, it resonated with us. because. As, as a creative entrepreneur, I personally don't like politics much. Uh, I know a lot of other people here don't like the nature of our politics on the continent. Um, but unfortunately, we can't run away from it. So I'd like to know how we plan on using this network. And I'd like a, a lot more uh, specific steps in action in terms of how we build uh, our nature of lobbying, especially as you said. I love when you mentioned the pan-African context, because unfortunately, some of these small all organizations are very easy to crush uh, nationally. And we know the danger of our, our polarizing politics on the continent, right? Some of them actually affect even the, the survival of our own enterprises. And then I have to sneak in another question from uh, my fellow Dartmouth <laughs> uh, colleague, uh, Elijah. We knew the mic wouldn't come by here a second time, so <laughs> we, we had to seize that opportunity. Um, my question goes to the gentleman in Sudan and any, anybody who would like to contribute. Uh, my name is Elijah from Zambia, and I was inspired by the question asked about the type of education. Do you think the curriculum that is being taught in schools is irrelevant and not engaging to the young Africans as they go out into the real world? Because I'm sure many of us in this room who are entrepreneurs have succeeded in a way nobody thought imaginable. Yes. So what do you think should be done to the curriculum? What are your inputs? OK, so we've got sort of two very different questions here. Um, let's tackle the, the first around how we lobby. How we lobby, but how we also kind of move between this public and private sector and not leave to just one industry or the other. How do we? Uh, sort of make that move, yeah. I think I'll start by saying you have to read. Many people do not read the policies, the budgets, the constitutions that their governments yeah. produce. So if you can't read them, how will you debate? And how will you ask for things that they may just say it's in the policy? Yeah. So you need to read. 
And uh, in that way, when you read, you would then be able to be informed of what other people are doing in other countries, what other people are doing elsewhere, better practices. But if you do not read, it's just, a you can't do anything much. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would advise, is that begin reading the policies. If you see anything that's not in line with your business or you think can be changed, advise based on what you've actually read, rather than you call a radio station, you make a statement, and it's not really based on facts. So you have to read. Um, Any other thoughts on this one? Yeah, I would just like to add a comment to that. Um, you know, in most of our countries, the age group, 18 to 35, probably f forms the largest portion of the electorate. But if I ask how many of us actually vote when it comes to election time, mm -hmm. not many of us. So I would say the first step, and probably the most important step to lobbying, is to actually critique and look at who the potential leaders are and go and vote. Yes, there's issues around how the elections get counted and all of that. But a major thing I've noticed is as youth, we make a lot of noise about we don't like this particular leader. But if you ask, did you vote? The, the response may be different. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think it's the first step is to register and vote for who you think. Because there's a quote, I don't know who says it, but it says a nation has a leader it deserves. You know, yeah. So if it's a bad leader, <laughs> it's also <laughs> our responsibility. Well, I think on top of uh, being able to read, we should create and maintain strong networks because like Hamas said rightly that as individual companies or organizations, it's very easy to get crushed. But if on top of reading and understanding matters of policy, we agreed amongst ourselves because we are talking Pan-Africanism here. If you're in Zimbabwe, I'm in Uganda, someone else is in Zambia, Nigeria, and we are all speaking with one voice, it's easier for us to speak out against particular issues and be heard. Because this time it won't be just one organization speaking from one country or just two, but it will be all of us from everywhere saying the same thing. There is power in agreement. Okay, um, please. Um, so as a Pan-African advocate, I'd like to say that we can take advantage of associations. So there is the AU, the African Union, and in each region, we have ECOWAS, for example, for West Africa, and we have this regional. Each of these organizations have a youth council. Entrepreneurs don't like getting into politics, but we have to get into politics. Either we get into politics, or we make friends with our guys from the public management next door. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, so when we network, I guess entrepreneurs, we need to go network with those guys yeah. mm -hmm. and take down cards and take down contacts. Yeah. People in the AU, people in ECOWAS, and then we need to keep those relationships running. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think you probably all recognize this from your own in universities, too. It's, it's, um, it's clear that most fellows don't operate in a singular track, right? You have your foot in multiple doors, and so those networks are really enriched when you can kind of overstep those bounds and not stay in a particular track. Um, I want to get to the education question, and then, Justine, do we have a chance for one more question after that? OK, so um, the education question was along the lines of, do we think we're teaching the right things, and is the curriculum doing what it should do? Um, and so we have our, our two educators toward the end of the line here. Maybe we could hear from both of you. OK, yeah, thank you so much. Um, generally, like in say, I say in South Sudan, uh, the curriculum, our curriculum is developed nationally. And in order to align with the system, um, every school has to also adopt the same mm -hmm. curriculum. Then in my own experience, I've also realized inadequacies in the kind of curriculum which we have. But of course, changing, changing it will need a national effort. But our, at our level, what we are doing so far is um, we are trying to influence the state ministry of health because our, our state is known for agriculture. So we are influencing the state ministry to allow us to uh, designate some time uh, during the week to be teaching agriculture as a separate uh, subject and also demonstrating in the farm. So that is what we are doing, just to make sure uh, after secondary school, students have some practical uh, skills which they can employ in their, in their life. Excellent. Okay. In, in South Africa, <laughs> 
our maths and science is rated 145 out of 145 countries. So if, if you look at our curricula, if you get over 36%, you can pass. So we're teaching children to pass. We're not teaching children to get jobs. We're not te teaching children to understand. And what someone said earlier, if you can teach someone a language so they can get a job, what is more important, teaching them a subject that they're going to get 36% for or teaching them a subject they're going to get a job for? So our schools, we are private, not because we want to earn more money. We're private because we don't believe in the system that we have in South Africa. And it was my choice, and I said, I'm, a, I'm an African. I can do what I want. I'm going to bring my own curricula here. So we adopted the Cambridge curricula. We have a, our, if you look at the definition of education, it says it's a systematic approach to giving or receiving information. That's nonsense. Education is if you touch the stove, <laughs> if you touch the stove and you burn your hand, you're never going to touch the stove again. That's education. So, so in our, in our, those, those are our schools. Um, our schools are based on employment. We promise every child that comes to our school a job when they leave. It's a big promise, but we were bought out by a public company in the beginning of this year, and we're making that happen. If there's anyone in this room that really wants to get involved in education, they're serious about it, let's have a chat. Uh, the reality is that we need to make something happen from this. We can't spend six weeks here, go back, and just talk about it. We're here. Let's exchange cards. Let's meet. Let's hang out. Let's do it. Okay, there's a young woman here in a, a colorful dress. So, yeah. Is there a mic? Might need her. Um, hi everyone, my name is Taylor Dube, I'm from Zimbabwe. We're talking a lot about education and I'm a science teacher. Okay, so I want to talk to you on a very practical approach. So whilst I was here in America, I had the opportunity to go and visit high schools and talk to some teachers to see how they do things. And let me tell you one thing that we should be proud of is that in Africa, our students love school. We do not get incentives for having 100% attendance for school per term. We go to school. Your mother will beat you up to go to school, <laughs> and generally you love going to school, okay? <laughs> but this is the problem. The problem is our way to education is very theoretic, okay? So I want to challenge each and every one of us here. When you go back home, adopt a practical approach to education. So this is what I saw they do. They have this concept on job shadowing, okay? So this is a grade seven student. They've made up their mind. They know that they want to be a dentist, okay? So you're going to link this grade seven student to, okay, grade seven is like 13 years. I don't know what you call it in your countries. They'll link this child to a dentist. This child is going to go and see what the dentist does. And every time the dentist is whitening the teeth, this child is thinking of how I will make the teeth whiter when I'm now a dentist. Okay, so that's practical. So throughout university, you're thinking. When you're not doing your, your practical uh, project, whatever, you're thinking of how you can make the teeth whiter. You're thinking of the next chemical that you can add to enhance the whitening of teeth. Do you get where I'm coming from? So it's not just about teaching them theory. It's about a practical approach. So I'm one of the advocates for STEM, um, for the ad adoption of STEM education. STEM standing for science, technolo technology, engineering, and maths. Okay, I'm just saying, let's have a practical approach to education. In the, in the back, and I'll ask, um, yeah, in the back, is that good? Yeah, right there. Gentleman in the back, all the way in the back. There you go. It's on the way. No, I'll need it. Okay, so I'm, I'm told this is the last question. I'm, I apologize, uh, group. My name is Tim Kipchumba from Kenya. Uh, my question goes to Morwesi. Morwesi, Africa is certainly the last growth frontier. And I think President Obama has been uh, promoting that through G, uh, GES, the Entrepreneurship Summit, and YALI represents that opportunity. I found the idea of a cooperation between fellows from Africa and companies in Africa um, a more lasting way to do that. Could you please expound a little bit about what you're doing and, and how you're planning to do that a bit much more so that we can get out of this place with solid partnerships and business between Africa and America? Thanks. 
Um, so one of the things that we did at Rutgers so far is, uh, as I said, establish some core values around what we want to do. We've um, you know, crafted an MOU. And uh, we actually have also sourced our professor that was, that was leading us as our mentor. So we've got somebody to actually help us and support us and help us also with fundraising. Um, uh, obviously, what's going to be important is to establish you know, the rules of engagement going back. Because once you go back, we do run our own businesses anyway. But um, just agreed on some frameworks as to who's going to run this corporation for us. Um, I, th I think I think you know we have to run this like we would run our own businesses. Uh, the only difference is that uh, we, we 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 just you know spread sp spread up all over all, all over different countries. Um, I'm just imagining that um, we will have to use a lot of technology to, to get together, but also a lot of um, the links that we have here is what's really going to anchor us and support us going forward. We have to continue that relationship with the universities that, that we've been with. And I think when we maximize on those relationships, we'll, 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 we'll get to go further. It would be nice to actually get to also meet other fellows and see if any, anyone else is interested in pursuing something like this uh, with us or pursuing different sectors um, collectively, you know, we could really um, end up setting up a, a good benchmark here for future yalis because if you can have a thousand uh, of us have a common vision around change and making change in Africa and actually practically doing it, and it happens every year. Uh, I mean, in 20 years' time, we're all going to be in leaders in leadership positions in government and in, in business. We can really see this uh, continent change significantly. Well, thank you for everyone that has joined us today. Thank you again to our speakers. To those who didn't get a chance to ask a question, the beautiful thing is this is just the start of the summit. So you have wonderful people in the room and on the stage who you can continue to find and to talk with. Um, I hope we'll see you this afternoon. Thank you to our